My name is Richard Doty. I'm a former intelligence officer. Today's presentation is on the Men in Black. The Men in Black is probably one of the most controversial subject within the UFO community. And it's been lingering for many, many years. First mention of Men in Black was back in the early 1950s during a UFO case near Watertown, New York. A couple saw an object in the sky behind their home on a winter night in 1952. The next day, without reporting it to anyone, two men showed up at their house, dressed in black suits, looking quite mysterious, asking this couple if they had a UFO experience. And they both said, yes, we saw an object flying around near our home, and we believe it landed. And the two men asked him if they'd taken pictures. And the woman said, yes, I did. I took a Polaroid picture and showed one of the men in black the Polaroid picture. The men in black said, we need to take that picture. We're from the government. Later on, an APRO investigator came and talked to the couple. They reported the case, documented it. And that was the first mention of men in black. Who are these mysterious men in black? According to the legend, men in black travel in groups of threes. They're often described as slender, strange looking, almost non-human. They sometimes flash government credentials. On other occasions, they pose as insurance adjusters, utility workers, or a list of other professions. Their questions almost always pertain to UFO sightings, contacts, or some other strange incident related to UFOs or ET contacts. The common denominator is that they invariably appear in an effort to obtain information from the witnesses or somebody who saw the event, the UFO or alien contact, or took pictures of something flying around in the sky. The MIBs utilize every technique possible to obtain the evidence of a UFO incident or event, including photographs or any debris left by. Intimidation, harassment, or even threats can be deployed by the men in black. Once the evidence is received, the MIBs leave, sometimes as mysteriously as they arrive. People go on podcasts, YouTube videos, reporting that these men in blacks are really extraterrestrials posing as humans. The MIBs often drive black vehicles with either no license plates or US government plates. MIB comes to your house after an event, ask you for pictures or debris left that you might have collected. They can intimidate you, they can threaten you. If you don't cooperate with them, they might leave, but at three o'clock in the morning, something happens in your house, a break-in, and then you find that the items that you have regarding that UFO event or the pictures that you took are missing. Did the MIBs break into your house, steal these things? Helicopters. Why did some people see helicopters after MIB? I relate a story that was told to me by two people who witnessed an event near Grand Forks, North Dakota. Now, Grand Forks, North Dakota, there's an Air Force base there, Grand Forks Air Force Base. The base at one time contained missiles, Minuteman missile, and also B-52 bombers. This couple lived near a missile site. One night, a strange light appeared over the missile site, which was located behind their home a few miles. The man went out on a patio on his back porch and started taking pictures with a, a 35 millimeter camera. This man took the pictures and went into the house, not thinking much about it, thinking again that it was something to do with the Air Force. Shortly afterwards, he heard helicopters in the sky. He went out on his porch and there's this black helicopter flying just above his house. He thought, what would that helicopter be doing? It doesn't have any markings that he could see. Again, this was near, near dusk. So he watched it. He decided to take some pictures of it. He went in the house, got his camera, again, a 35 millimeter camera, and started taking pictures of the helicopter. The helicopter then flew away. He went to bed at midnight. Somebody's knocking on his door. So he went to the door, and on the outside of the door are these two men dressed in black clothing. And he asked them, what do they want? And they said, we need to talk to you about the photographs you took. And he said, are you with the government? And showed him credentials. He didn't recognize the credentials, although this man wasn't familiar with what a government credential would look like. He let him in, showed him a camera. Of course, he hadn't developed the pictures yet. He said, here's the camera. The film's still in the camera. I think I took somewhere between 12 and 15 pictures. They said, listen, we'll just roll the film forward. Give us the film. We'll develop them and give you the pictures back. He trusted them. So he said, fine. So he did that. He gave them the 35 millimeter roll and he asked for a receipt. This was strange because they didn't understand what a receipt was. Finally, he, they caught on to what he was trying to say. They went out to his vehicle, got a paper and wrote down that they took a roll of film 
from this man and they would bring him back. Well, you guess it, they never seen these men in black again. They called the Air Force, they called the FBI, they called everyone within the government they could think of, and they know, knew nothing of these pictures or this film. The truth of the matter is the MIBs did not create the legend. The MIBs simply took the opportunity of the past legends to fulfill their required mission. As suspected, they really are employees by the United States government specifically by the United States Air Force. They're members of a rather bizarre unit of the United States Air Force. The MIBs are assigned to a special branch called Tangle, Air Force Special Activity Center, located at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. They're assigned to the 62nd OS2 Air Intelligence Wing, which is part of the Air Force Intelligence Command. These are assigned to various field operating units throughout the United States. So they're available to respond to events anywhere in the United States. The MIBs are primarily devoted to human, meaning human intelligence operations. This unit and its predecessors have long been among the most secret operations of the military intelligence family in the world. They take the missions that nobody else will take, including the MIB missions. Most MIBs are sheep dipped from the military, meaning that even though they are military, they're taken administratively out of the military, given civilian credentials, a civilian background, and then placed back into the system. The MIBs are trained in safe cracking, surreptitious entries, and assorted masters of deception. Military organizations, discipline, and paperwork were secondary importance to their primary mission. So they don't conform to anything military, you know, although most of them are still within the military. Administratively, they're civilians. Operationally, they're military. They are often assigned to the most dangerous of American covert intelligence operations. So they have to be specially trained and they have to be fit a special category of people in order to operate and perform their missions. There's no question that this group has been connected with clandestine collection of UFO-related information. UFO researchers have disclosed two documents that confirms this. AFCIN Policy Letter 20512 clearly states that the field operating units participates in Project Blue Book and later Project Cameo Sling. Project Cameo Sling is a similar follow-up operation to Project Blue Book. Of course, Project Blue Book was closed in 1969 after the condom report, but the investigation of UFOs within the Air Force was continued. And one of the projects that continued the investigation of UFOs within the Air Force was Project Cameo Sling. Another policy letter that was found in the files of the Air Force Intelligence, letter 20510, was a re regulation that allowed UFO field recovered teams to operate independently. That created some problems because most military units have a commander and they operated within the chain of command. Well, the MIBs didn't. They operated independently. And why? What was the justification that the government gave these MIBs permission to operate independently? Well, the answer is their mission. The uniqueness of their mission. The uniqueness of what they had to get and what they had to do and how they had to do it. The government figures these people these MIBs were trained very well and they had the morality to fit their job and therefore they could operate independently. Now, as most people know, if you give somebody the job of operating independently, they might make up their own rules, their own policies, their own procedures to fit the mission. Could that jeopardize safety and security of, of the humans that they were talking to or the witnesses that were talking to? In some, some instances, probably yes. Could they operate independently every single time and hold some kind of code of honor or code of conduct? There's stories out there that will refute that. There's stories out there, many stories, books are written about what the MIB did to disinform somebody, fool them, scare them, or even break in their house to steal what they had that they wouldn't give to the MIBs. But if you were a contact person, meaning if you were contacted by an MIB and they threatened you or they might have intimidated you or bullied you and you were upset by it, who would you report it to? You'd call the local police and tell them? You think they're going to believe you? You're going to call the FBI and tell them? You think they're going to believe you? 
They might believe you, but they're not going to do anything about it because they're going to know who was there talking to you. So most of these witnesses out there that were confronted by the MIBs had no alternative but to cooperate. They felt threatened. Eventually, the people gave in. A lot of them reported it to the local police, the sheriffs, or to the FBI. Nothing was ever done. The real men in black don't operate out of a military base or an army post or a navy base. They operate out of a non-government building. Locations such as private contractors are used. U.S. government contractors offices, state or local utility companies are utilized by the MIBs. Now, let me tell you a secret. Not a secret anymore because I'm going to tell you about it. In the 1950s, the MIBs operated out of telephone offices, Bell Telephone. They had offices within the Bell Telephone. Now, stop and think why that would be, yes bugging phone lines. Back in the 50s, it took very little knowledge or technology to bug your phone. There was a central switch, and sometimes all your calls had to be had to go through that switch or that building through an operator. So it was easy to record who you were calling, the number you were calling, and then put a recorder on that line or that switch box. The field operating detachments are funded through confidential monies specifically allocated to the U.S. intelligence community. It's called black funding, meaning money that comes from someplace, sometimes within the government, appropriated. That means Congress is the only entity within our government can appropriate funds for the government to use, utilize, and sometimes outside the government. MIBs operate under the authority of several classified executive orders. Now, this presented a case some years ago when people tried to sue the government because MIBs came and stole their camcorder, kind of an older one. Of course, it was in late 80s and 90s. They got an attorney. The attorney tried to figure out who they were going to sue. Who, who are they going to sue? Eventually, the family gave up because they didn't know who to sue. This lawsuit got to the Department of Justice, who figured that the men in black was justified in taking that camera. The MIBs do have the authority to obtain covert class clandestine search warrants under federal intelligence surveillance courts. Most warrants are obtained for recovery of classified documents or information. MIBs can obtain assistance from special agents within the Air Force Office of Special Investigations or even the FBI. MIBs operate in total secrecy with or without local government approval. You might have seen an MIB and not really know that you saw it. You might have encountered an MIB without really knowing it. They're experts in concealment. They're experts in uh, clandestine operations. Uh, they might even bugged your house without you knowing it. Now, most of the information that's gathered by the MIBs are non-criminal in nature, meaning you're not going to be prosecuted for, for having something or being a target of their investigation. They want something you have. Once they get it, the investigation's over with. After uncovering the secrets of the Men in Black and their mysterious operations, you might be wondering why such agencies exist and what they might be hiding. If you want to know why these agencies were created and why they're covering up this information, you should go ahead and click here to watch this video next.